Solutions in Oakland, California. Uh, thanks for joining our webinar today on environmental liabilities for public agencies. We'll be starting the webinar in just a moment, uh, but in the meantime, just uh, one or two housekeeping items. If you'll notice on the Go to Webinar control panel, uh, you'll see a space near the bottom of the user interface for chat and for uh, uh, questions. Feel free to use those throughout our presentation today if you've got any questions or uh, particularly if there are any audio concerns that you've got. Uh, I would love to know about those. I've got a separate screen open here on my side as I go through the content, uh, so I'll be able to monitor those, uh, uh, those messages as we go forward. But with that in mind, why don't we get started here today. Uh, first of all, uh, I just want to give you a sense of the outline of the content today. I'll give you a brief background on my uh, area of expertise and what I've been working on, uh, and then cover the, uh, the trends and the status of looking at generally accepted accounting principles for looking at uh, uh, quantifying, documenting, and managing environmental liabilities, or as they're called for public agencies, pollution, remediation obligations. They're synonymous, synonymous terms that just use in different portions of GAP. Uh, with that, I'll be also reviewing uh, processes and best practices for estimating and disclosing uh, pollution remediation liabilities, and then going over uh, briefly one aspect of, uh, of uh, getting a good number, getting a good valuation for an obligation, and that's calculating non-performance risk of a counterparty default. We'll have plenty of time uh, for questions, and uh, I'll do my best to provide answers as we go forward here. Uh, but with that, let's uh, dive into my uh, background here. First of all, I started uh, this company, uh, Environmental Risk Communications, Inc., in California 20 years ago, last February. I'm the founder and CEO and author of a software tool called Defender. Defender is used by uh, corporations and port authorities uh, across the country to uh, analyze their environmental liability portfolios, whether they're environmental and uh, asset retirement obligations or they are uh, under GASB uh, pollution remediation obligations. We believe we've looked at and worked with uh, about 2,800 unique liabilities. That's unique addresses, unique facilities, unique, uh, unique projects. We've also completed about 200 decision analysis projects on environmental liabilities alone. That's, that's all we work on. We've also supported uh, uh, four U.S. port authorities, predominantly located here on the West Coast, where we are uh, with their work in uh, assessing, documenting, and in turn disclosing their pollution remediation obligations. We've also developed some innovative software in helping uh, companies and, and PRP groups, or PLP groups, uh, look at environmental counterparties. That is the, uh, uh, the fellow PRPs or PLPs that are helping fund cleanup work over the long term. My background, uh, I've got a master's in business from Northwestern and a bachelor's in business from Georgetown, so two business degrees. Uh, I don't know that there are a lot of people like me out there that are uh, helping assess environmental liabilities. But again, I just want to stress, I'm not an attorney. So I'll be reviewing some laws and regulations, but I'm not an attorney. I'm not speaking as an attorney, of course. I'm not an environmental engineer or a mechanical or civil engineer or chemical engineer. I'm also not a CPA. I have a different background. I approach environmental liabilities from the business perspective and as well from the software development perspective. So why are we here today? Principal reason uh, of having uh, principal reason for having good books is to prevent distortions to the allocations of resources. So a good statement of what environmental liabilities are over the long run uh, helps make sure that companies are effectively and efficiently using the resources that they're trusted with, people, capital, time. Um, another reason why we're here today is to forecast accurately, forecast environmental liability, pollution remediation obligations accurately, which means we have to get into how we think about them, how we calculate them, how we state them. And that involves us in some, actually in every case I've worked with, uh, rethinking, revalidating uh, the tools, policies, and procedures that are in place. Why does that matter? Why does having accurate forecasts matter? Well, a credit rating of an organization, which affects everybody on this call, a credit rating affects the cost of capital. If there's an honest, stable, accurate credit rating, uh, the cost of capital will be optimally low which is all, as we all understand, is, is desirable, it's good, it's appropriate. Um, in addition, if there is a, a accuracy in forecasting, liquidity is going to be managed and satisfied. And liquidity affects whether an organization can really survive, whether there are some uh, significant trade-offs that occur uh, when environmental obligations have to be funded. Uh, and, and finally, uh, transparency really does affect our borrowing capacity. Sarbanes-Oxley and in the private sector uh, Dodd-Frank is the newest uh, uh, 
all-encompassing piece of uh, financial transparency legislation on a federal level. Uh, encouraging transparency is just part of a long-term trend. And, and having transparent, trustworthy financial statements is all part of uh, uh, having a robust, healthy uh, borrowing capacity, along with having a low cost of capital and liquidity. So those are the business aspects of having good, a good financial statement around in, uh, environmental obligations, around pollution remediation obligations. But first and foremost, once the funds are available, once there's a commitment to do some work, uh, we found that there's really no substitute for the next four bullet items, knowing and understanding life cycle costs, believing, trusting life cycle cost forecasts, managing similar liabilities in similar ways, which may sound easy, but it actually is, is quite a challenge in our field here. Continually getting more efficient or doing more with less and finishing on time and under budget, being effective in spending uh, capital to resolve environmental obligations. So let's move on to the heart of the matter uh, for looking at environmental liabilities for public agencies. First and foremost, the principal standard setter for uh, environmental liabilities for pollution remediation obligations, as they're formally called, is the Government Accounting Standards Board in the U.S. GASB uh, has produced uh, uh, GASB Statement Number 49, which is the principal item for uh, looking at pollution remediation obligations. It's coming up on its uh, its 10th year anniversary. Uh, finalized November 2006 and went into effect shortly thereafter uh, for financial statements issued in 2007 and later. So it was uh, uh, it's been around for quite some time. It's incredibly stable. It hasn't been extensively edited, rewritten, reorganized. That statement that came out in November 2006 is highly, highly durable. It's uh, uh, and we'll go over some aspects of it, uh, but the aspects that were out there in draft form in 2004 uh, and 2005, when it was called GASB 3-12 in draft form, uh, are now pretty much the way that, that, that it, exactly the way it's working today. There hasn't been a significant change to GASB 49. I say that as a, pr a practitioner. I don't say that as an attorney, as an environmental engineer, as a CPA. I say that as a practitioner. We haven't had to redo our software. We haven't had to change our instruction set, we've really seen that GASB 49 is, uh, is, is the fundamental definition of how to look at uh, environmental issues in an organization and a public agency and how to, to book and, uh, and discharge them. Uh, the next uh, a key point to remember when looking at generally accepted accounting principles for environmental liabilities is there's an ongoing convergence between FASB, the Financial Accounting Standards Board, which works for uh, uh, private corporations and GASB, which addresses the needs of public agencies like state and local governments and uh, universities, airport authorities, and so on. That convergence means that GASB is, is more or less gradually adopting key components of FASB in a more formal sense. And uh, we'll get into that in, a, in a, another slide or two. But I just want to say there's a continuing ongoing alignment of GASB uh, pronouncements and GASB statements like GASB 49, catching up with what's already in place in FASB. And, and we'll get into a particular case study regarding asset retirement obligations uh, in a little bit. Um, finally, first and uh, first uh, foremost point is just as it is in Canada and it is in the U.S., there is no change to the fundamental part of public policy, which has been around for more than a generation, that polluter pays and that environmental expenditures are uh, tax deductible. But with that, I just want to give a little bit of a a high-level view about how that convergence is working. Uh, in, in this uh, uh, table here I've developed, I've got three columns for U.S. corporations, U.S. public agencies, and non-U.S. corporations to give a sense of, of how different areas of practitioners of, of general accepted accounting principles just have different standards to work with. And again, my background is, is putting the standards in front of, of uh, uh, environmental project teams and helping them figure out what is worthy, what's worth recognizing as a liability today versus what needs to go on a watch list for a future reserve increase or a future uh, liability, uh, liability forecast. So just to jump down a, a couple of, uh, of slides, I'm sorry, a couple of rows here, the gap basis uh, for U.S. corporations is something called ASC for Accounting Standards Codification 410-30. That covers uh, environmental obligations. Uh, the predecessors were, were things like SOP 961, which came out from uh, uh, the American Institute of CPAs. Uh, FASB Statement Number 5, which came out during uh, back in 1975 uh, from uh, 
of the Financial Accounting Standards Board. And then the SEC statement, um, uh, Staff Accounting Bulletin uh, number 92, which came out coincidentally in 1992. Those, those documents are on now all rolled together into one comprehensive, uh, uh, straightforward document that reads in about 40 pages. It's, it's a long one. But ASC 410-30 covers uh, the gap portion for U.S. corporations. U.S. public agencies, uh, as I noted before, are working under GASB 49, which is a, roughly a 70-page document that's available from the GASB, G-A-S-B dot org website for free. Uh, it's the standard document. Uh, it's not the only one, but it's the key one. Uh, before it was uh, finalized, it was called GASB Project 3-12. And again, the term of art has been Pollution Remediation Obligations. Pros, uh, for short, PRO. Uh, we've used that term for 10 years now, and we've found that it's important to call them obligations because it gets uh, a, a mindset and, and helps with training and tools and, and uh, uh, communications. Obligations are different from some other uh, types of liabilities called contingencies. Now, contingencies go by a very strict legal language that goes, goes back actually hundreds and hundreds of years to English common law. And the, uh, the definition of a contingency is that it's probable and reasonably estimable. So if you heard that language from FASB 5 in corporations, if, you're, if you've been around long enough, you hear we, we recognize environmental liabilities when, when it's probable that a loss has occurred and the, the, the liability is reasonably estimable. That's the language. That language comes from indirectly from FASB 5, and it's been restated and reinterpreted in uh, ASC 410-30. However, any obligations are different from contingencies. And so when you look at environmental liabilities, uh, it's important to remember that, that uh, if the obligation is, is what we're really trying to work with over the long term, that's the trend, is if there's an obligation from your organization, let's say you work for a port authority, if there's an obligation from your organization to comply with environmental laws and regs, which frankly there, there is in the U.S., if there's that obligation, what is the cost of complying with that obligation? That's the question and answer cycle. Uh, again, the old definitions that, that people worked with for a generation were, until a regulator comes in and says, here's your notice of violation. We, we took some samples. We found a problem. Here is your statement of problem. Go ahead and look at it. Uh, that used to be the, the benchmark for putting money into a reserve was you, you discovered you had a problem and you have uh, now an instruction set about how to go about solving it with a regulator. You, you, you now have an instruction set to, to validate the liability is there and then price it out. From there. You're in a process. An obligation is different from a contingency. So again, if there's some questions about it, I recommend getting the environmental attorney team to look at this portion of GAP and really evaluate it more seriously inside your project team. Uh, but first and foremost, the, the thing that we found in working with companies, working with public agencies, and looking through environmental liabilities is just this. So if there's nothing you take away from today, it's this. They're obligations. They're not contingencies anymore. They're obligations. Pollution remediation obligations have been the term of art since November 2006, since GASB 49 came out. What's coming next is the next row that I've got on this table called fair value measurement. Fair value measurement means you, you more or less you have to find yourself uh, in someone else's shoes on the outside looking in at your organization and trying to value the liabilities, value the obligations uh, from a third-party perspective. That is, say, if, if a vendor or a competing organization or a peer organization were to take over the pollution remediation obligations, what would they charge? That's the market price. That's the fair value measurement. In U.S. corporations, to go to that, that first column there, FASB 157 came up in September 2006. That hit right before the, the, uh, the, the, the recession. I say that it made the recession incredibly more complex to, to work with uh, in the economy over the last 10 years. FASB 157 and fair value measurement have been part of U.S. corporations uh, compliance with GAAP for almost, uh, uh, almost eight, well, for eight years now in finalized form. It's coming up, to move over to the next column to the right, it's coming up in the draft stage for U.S. public agencies which means the next couple of steps are um, uh, to look at fair value measurement for pollution remediation obligations, which means if you were to work at, for example, the Port of Los Angeles, you get to step back and say, what would the Port of Long Beach right next door, uh, 
uh, charge if I were to say, I, I, I need you to take on my environmental liabilities, manage them, never call me back about them, but just take them on. What, what would you charge to do the work and the premium and answer the regulator's calls and, and handle the litigation and anything else that comes up forever? That's the question. That's the fair value measurement basis. That's been going on actually from uh, 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 on the corporate sector. If you look in the left and right columns here for U.S. corporations and non-U.S. corporations, there are actually standards in place already to look at environmental obligations that way. Uh, so it's it's important to note that GASB will be catching up. It's coming up. It's part of the work plan that's in place for uh, the, the the GASB work teams in Connecticut. They're already they already have a schedule announced on their website. So I'd say this is something to get ready for. You should already be ready for GASB 49, and you should be getting ready for fair value measurement. Those will be two big changes to tools, policies, procedures, training. So it'll all have to be affected by that. With that, let me wrap up on the last two items on this. Uh, uh, inflation to a future value is not allowed on GASB 49. It's supposed to be current value only. That is today's dollars, as if we were settling the liability today. And there is no discounting to a present value. So there's uh, that is allowed in U.S. corporations, that is allowed in foreign corporations, but it is not part of stating an environmental obligation or a pollution remediation obligation uh, under GAS 249. Again, just to sum up, GAS 249 uh, was issued in November of 06. It, it's based on current value, no inflation, no discounting. It's also based on the expected cash flow basis. When will money be going out to, uh, to, to pay for a study investigation, remediation, and O&M work, uh, and assort associated overhead and cost recovery work. And then will cost recoveries be coming in, if any? And uh, the, the next bullet point I've got there is it's got to be an expected value basis, which means waiting more than just the minimum or just the optimistic or just the, the short-term uh, uh, valuation of those tasks. It's got to be a long-term view, and it's got to reflect of life cycle and weighted average basis. Uh, expected value, weighted average, uh, arithmetic mean, those all mean the same things and those calculations are not controversial. They're, they're weighed out in ASTM standard E2137 that came out in 2001. I, I recall that because I was on the committee that drafted it. And, and that standard has been out for quite some time. It's available for view from the ASTM.org website the fee, I think, is, is around $45 for a copy of that standard. Um, and it explains in, in very, very strong detail how to, to uh, perform an expected value calculation for uh, environmental obligations or pollution remediation obligations. But the basics are the bullet points, the five that I've got displayed here, uh, weighting different outcomes like different cleanup technologies being used, factoring in the probability, uh, some would say the inevitability, of a remedy failure or additional remedy steps being needed out in the field, adding in uh, overhead of an organization as well as the cost of working capital, including a premium for counterparty non-performance risk, that is the, the inevitable probability of a counterparty or another um, a fellow polluter uh, not paying their share and, and your organization needing to pick up their share due to default or bankruptcy. And then finally, a risk transfer premium for the unknown uh, liabilities that haven't been fully characterized or uh, uh, explicitly stated in public policy because of a lack of uh, current regulations. So the, the takeaway that I want to share with you is that GASB 49 is comparable comparable to uh, FASB's ASC 410-30. Those are the two again, key documents. If you, if you read them both, uh, I, which I strongly recommend eventually getting to, GASB 49 is a good double-spaced 70-page read. It, it is extremely useful, extremely informative, and written in lay terminology, so it is uh, uh, something that a, a user who's not familiar with accounting policy can work with. Uh, ASC 410-30 is written in slightly more technical language, uh, but also references some of the very same terms that GASB 49 refers to. Just as an additional point about uh, uh, generally accepted accounting principles for public agency, uh, asset retirement obligations are the second big area. If you work in, in the private sector, you see that asset retirement obligations are often many times larger than environmental obligations, uh, the remediation uh, liabilities. Uh, that is because bringing uh, uh, demolition and pulling out asbestos, lead paint, mercury ballast, and fluorescent light tubes, uh, th those open-ended uh, uh, asset retirement obligations have uh, 
unknowns like timing, settlement cost, the method of settlement, uh, and, and consequently, asset retirement obligations are generally not, not thought of as, a, as anything other than a very, very long-term liability to accrue for in the private sector. In the public sector, it's been hit or miss so far. Uh, GASB 18, uh, which, uh, uh, as you might expect, uh, predates GASB 49 by, by 13 years. GASB 18 was issued in August of 93. It applies just to municipal landfills. And it was on, that was absolutely purposeful, that it was supposed to, to identify the long-term closure costs and post-closure care costs for municipal landfills that were reaching the end of their useful life. And again, it was based on the idea of calculating the current value without inflation or discounting of those long-term costs, putting those on the, uh, uh, the balance sheet of an organization that's uh, responsible for funding that work. GASB, 40, GASB 18, rather, uh, is the only item in place right now uh, strictly a, specifically covering asset retirement obligations. However, GASB 55, which came out a few years ago, restated the hierarchy uh, of GAAP for state and local governments, which would include port authorities, airports, and, and, and so on. Uh, and it, it says explicitly, and the GASB.org website reaffirms this as explicitly, is that GASB 55 allows filers, allows organizations preparing their books to use ASC 410-20, which covers asset retirement obligations, uh, to use that as a basis for saying, because GASB doesn't have an explicit statement about covering AROs for our buildings, for our pipelines, for our water treatment facilities, electrical systems, everything else, we're going to comply with uh, ASC 410-20 to, to state our asset retirement obligations and be GAP compliant. With that in mind, GASB's working on it. GASB's working on uh, a new statement just covering asset retirement obligations. It's probably a little under two years away based on the plan that's posted on their website. So if you're looking for specific guidance and getting ready, let me just go over that chronology one more time. GASB 49 is out now. It's been out for almost eight years. Um, fair value measurement is coming out soon, probably in the next 12 months, maybe even sooner. And it'll be, effectively, it'll be effective shortly after. The year after, 2016, asset retirement obligations. Those are the big three pillars of what we're looking at. But I just want to point out the standards that will be passed, the standards that will be in place for GASB, they're not going to be new. They're basically going to be uh, uh, applicable restatements of what's already been uh, stated under FASB. So you can sort of see what the future will be like for asset retirement obligations, fair value measurement. You can see that today by reading FASB on the FASB.org website, reading the FASB pronouncements on these topics, and already being in compliance in, on GASB 49 because that part's already in place. But just as a, <clears throat> excuse me, as a highlight, if you're looking for more detail on fair value measurement to roll back to that last topic, uh, feel free to, uh, to go to the GASB.org website, take a look at the exposure draft that was uh, released back in May. The public comment period is already closed. You may be able to review some of the public comments as they're posted. But the goal uh, of, the, uh, of the GASB staff is to issue the final statement for fair value measurement next year and have it be, in effect, uh, more or less immediately. Let me go over a little bit about how fair value measurement does affect the work that we're, uh, we're doing in looking at pollution remediation obligations. What it basically does is it inflates the liabilities because of other factors that we normally see out in the field. Uh, so what we uh, may have done in the past is base a pollution remediation obligation, or a GASB 49 estimate of an environmental obligation, uh, just on a vendor quote. So I've got this gray bar on the, on the left side of my screen here, uh, where a vendor quote for maybe two and a half million is the basis for estimating uh, a pollution remediation obligation. What fair value measurement requires the filer to do is in order to have a compliant fair value measurement estimate that there has to be a factoring in of other issues. And they're not uniform, just add 5% for this, 10% for that, and you're done. It isn't that simple. The marketplace isn't that clean and efficient these days. Instead, there is a requirement to think about each site and evaluate each site and pull out an Excel spreadsheet for each site and really make sure that contingencies like remedy failure, project management, counterparty default, that they're all factored in with whatever unique site-specific attributes are required in order to reach a fair value calculation of what the market would charge to take on a liability. And again, this is a site-specific example, and the 
work normally has to be done site by site by site. Let me give you an example of those calculations just to, to show you what, what sort of effort is required. It's really not extensive, and when we do this work, we're normally, we normally start and finish within an hour to get from a, a, uh, uh, an original vendor quote to get to a fair value measurement. It's not a time-consuming process. It does require training. It does require fluency with the tools, policies, and procedures. It does require reading GASB 49, but the implementation itself is not a time intensive process. Let me start in the, in the lower left corner where there's a box labeled vendor quote and say, let me give you a hypothetical here and just talk you through it for uh, about two minutes here. Say we've got a vendor quote uh, for managing, uh, putting in a groundwater pump and treat system. Let's say it's going to cost $2 million to install, $3 million to run over the desired operating period. Let's say that's going to be 10 or 20 years. So it's going to be a $5 million cost, and we expect to get 50% cost sharing from our fellow participants, our fellow funders. And these can be insurance companies, uh, next door neighbors that also have a contamination issue. Uh, these can be former owners or successor owners of a property. They're, they're PRPs or different parts of the country. Those are called PLPs. Uh, and they're going to be sharing in the cost. So our net cost of the $5 million system right now is what we know today, $2.5 million. So that's our vendor quote for a starting point. Moving to the box in the upper left corner, remedy failure. Uh, we work with a, a, an environmental consultant who will, uh, if we ask him the direct question, will tell us directly, similar systems like this have an 80% chance of working just fine, as desired. They'll work just fine, and they'll, they'll remove the contamination, and the problem will go away. However, there's inevitably some percentage, so let's just say as a hypothetical, let's say there's an 80% chance it works, 20% chance it doesn't. It differs from site to site and technology to technology and contaminant plume to contaminant plume. Every one of them is different. There's no universal 80-20. This is just an example. But here, at 20, there's a 20% chance this hypothetical will have to expand the remedy, and that means we're going to incur as a group an extra $4 million of cost, and as a group, share those costs around, so our share will be half of that or uh, $2 million. So the math is the next row down, 80% chance there'll be zero incremental cost, and 20% chance there'll be $2 million incremental cost, or an expected value impact, or that nice blue box there toward the center of the slide, of $400,000. Uh, the next box over is for project management. And there we add on 10%, just as a rule of thumb, 10% uh, for the internal cost of having cost accounting system that's uh, government compliant, uh, having a, a purchase order system, uh, having a financial control system in place, having a project manager who will correspond with agencies, uh, regulatory agencies who will secure construction permits, grading permits, uh, groundwater discharge permits. That internal cost isn't free. Burdening the cost of the fair value measurement estimate with those costs is vital. It's stated in GASB 49, it's part of ASC 410, Putting that overhead into the forecast is important. Next point is looking at the counterparty risk. Uh, and this gets it into a uh, little more intricate uh, calculations because it requires knowing the individual counterparties. So let's say in this example we know uh, who the counterparties are, and we think uh, based on their current credit quality, there's a 60% chance over the life of this work we won't have any defaults. They'll pay their share, we'll pay our share, everything. There's also a 25% chance that we'll have one default and that will increase our costs alone of about a million dollars. There's a 50% chance we'll have two of those PRPs default, meaning that our costs will go up by $2 million. And those will be mutually exclusive options. So those, those three uh, different nodes of a decision tree, if you will, they add up to 100%. So there's a 60% chance there will be a zero impact, 25% chance there will be a million dollar impact and a 15% chance there'll be a $2 million impact. Therefore, running the math out, $600,000 impact for um, uh, that issue of counterparty risk of default. If you add up the blue boxes to the original gray box, you go from $2.5 million of a vendor quote to a $3.8 million fair value measurement estimate. The 3.8 is what should go on the books, not the 2.5. The 3.8 is what you should be booking, not the 2.5. So that's it for fair value measurement, and I just want to reaffirm we're all caught up on questions. I don't see any questions uh, or uh, comments sitting in our queue, so I'm just going to uh, uh, 
uh, move on to our next uh, statement of what a portfolio looks like. And that's really to, to say that individual sites will have different, uh, if you will, different flying bar charts. The, the, the initial gray bar to the far left of a vendor quote may be zero, it may be a significant number, uh, and the other bars may be much more significant. They may, may be much higher cost to calculating uh, the life cycle costs of the obligation. And the way that we like to think of, of environmental projects <clears throat> or environmental obligations at ERCI is we try and look at sites that have more, uh, in, in the first example, the far left, more implementation risk, uh, where there's a question about how well and how smoothly the field construction work will fall into place. Uh, in the middle example, you see a, a, a site that had, or a project that has more counterparty risk, that everything in terms of, of what would be booked uh, before fair, fair value measurement, everything looks fine. However, the astronomical risk is that the counterparty that's supposed to be funding the work in this middle example doesn't look like they're going to make it and doesn't look like they're going to fund the work in the time span that a regulator requires and the fallback will be that it comes back to us and that we'll have to fund the work ourselves. So a, a, an outsider looking at a financial statement will not care whether a site has more implementation risk or counterparty risk. They'll just care that there aren't surprises sitting in the financial statements or that there are, there are off-balance sheet surprises that are waiting to get onto the financial statements. They'll just care that there's deliberate, specific, site-specific thinking and calculations that show that if, if a site does have counterparty risk, that there's an awareness that things are being done about it, and if it happens, that it, the organization, the team, is on it, and they're doing things to manage that counterparty risk. With that, let me move forward to our, our next uh, a couple of points about what auditors can ask. And this has been a, a delicate subject because auditors are really the key to enforcement of GASB 49 and have been since it was passed. And one of the challenges that most auditors see is that in, uh, pollution remediation obligations don't look to be a big number. They don't look to be a material number like, like pensions or accounts payable or other types of liabilities that are on a balance sheet of a company. Uh, they just look to be modest. Uh, I just want to reaffirm for you that auditors have a whole range of tools at their disposal to ask uh, incredibly demanding tough questions to really get at the, the focal points of, of what the pollution remediation obligations ought to be. So a couple areas of questions that they can ask are about how the forecasts were prepared. One is an auditor can ask, was this estimate prepared independently of stakeholders? Uh, uh, you know, so example, let me give you an example here. Let's say that there's a, a, a spill of, of, uh, of, of kerosene at an airport. Kerosene is the fuel that, that jet engines run on and have run on for, for, uh, for, for over 70 years. Kerosene is a, a very common environmental hazard used at airports. It just You need kerosene to run your planes. That's part of what, what the airport needs to run on is it needs to bring in fuel via pipelines or trucks and then distributed via pipelines and trucks. So an airport is going to have gasoline, kerosene, jet fuel. It's going to have those, those materials on site. If there are spills, which unfortunately are just, again, a part of having the materials on site, if there are spills, then they're going to be, uh, uh, going to be in the environment. If there's an estimate for an environmental liability, and that's prepared by someone at the P&L level, the profit and loss responsibility level at the airport, in other words, if uh, uh, the airport manager asks his direct report, his environmental manager, give me an estimate of what it would cost to clean up. There's a conflict of interest. An auditor can call out that, that communication chain and say, the person who's preparing that estimate works for the person who wants to keep that number as small as possible and defer that work as long as possible. Uh, so the pollution remediation obligation will still be there whether these two come to work or not. And if these two talk together and, and in their working, they don't get to what is the obligation for the organization, what belongs on the books, and how will it get fixed someday. If those two have a, a lack of independence, it's not unusual. But if there's no resolution of that, then that's what an auditor can, can come in, step in, and say, there's, there's a conflict of interest here. The people that are doing the work, a vendor who would do the work, is preparing the estimate for his own scope of work. That's another conflict of interest. 
So those are two things that an auditor can dive in and look at today and say, is there a, a systematic challenge for recognizing what an environmental liability is or a pollution remediation obligation is today? And what can uh, an auditor do about it? Um, ne the next uh, thing that an auditor can do is just check and see if an, an estimate has been peer reviewed by an outsider that doesn't have any uh, a problem with their objectivity, that they, they don't have any uh, second agenda that they're trying to satisfy. Um, moving on to the weighting of scenarios, has the pro and con of a given scenario been documented fully? Is there thinking that's been done in place or were the estimates rushed through? Is the thinking based on similar liabilities? Maybe not just at, at, at one agency's uh, site, but at comparable sites across the country. This is where the Internet's an amazing resource, resource tool where you can see the cleanup plans for different facilities identical to yours. If you work at a university, or you work at a hospital, or you work at an airport, or a port authority, you can see comparable sediment cleanups. You can see comparable uh, fuel spill cleanups. You can see comparable pipeline leak cleanups all across the country. You can get a ballpark cleanup cost just for the sake of an hour's worth of research. And your consultants can as well. It's n never been a better, better time to get a feeling for what similar liabilities or comps, as they're called in the real estate field, what comps look like, comparables. Next about weighting of the scenarios, is there confidence of the success and is there a backup plan if the uh, initial strategy doesn't work? This is information that generally consultants, environmental consultants that are out there in the field that I've had the pleasure of working with for over 20 years, they're happy to give this, but they need to be asked. They need to be given permission to, to give a hypothetical, to speculate about whether a plan that they're proposing is going to actually be successful. They've got an opinion. They definitely have an opinion, and they're generally happy to share it, and they're generally happy to do something about the less than certain outcomes. But again, if they're being asked uh, just what, does, what do you think it will cost next year, they'll just give the answers provided. But if they're asked about confidence of success and what should the backup plan be, you'll get their be the best out of them. But that's, again, part of tools, policies, and procedures. Uh, finally, uh, about the weighting of scenarios, do users understand what they're being asked, what they're being uh, told to do? Uh, one of the things that I've seen in my experience is if uh, an auditor says, where is your weighting? An environmental manager may go away and say, okay, uh, there's a 99% chance we'll pump the groundwater out, 1% chance we'll actually dig up all of the soil and send it away to a landfill, uh, uh, and it'll cost 10 times as much as the, the groundwater uh, pump and treat plan that I came up with. Well, that's not really a robust, thorough thinking to have a 99%, 1%. Uh, I, I've raised two teenagers. I know when I'm given a fake set of choices myself, when I'm being presented a false array of options. I know. I know inherently. And that's another thing an auditor can look at is, is say, you know, when, when we're offered one or two options or three or four options, are they reasonably doable, creative alternatives? Or are they sort of sandbag alternatives of, no, yeah, you wouldn't go with the crazy expensive option, no kidding, uh, move on to the next box to check. Deliberate, high-quality thinking, deliberate uh, uh, use of the tools and understanding how the tools work. It, it takes some training, and ERCI does that work, so I just want to put in our infomercial for a second. People don't come to work inherently knowing how to use a decision tree, Monte Carlo modeling, how to do the decision analysis work to look at environmental liability. But I do want to underscore that, that it's easy for an auditor to look at a decision tree and say, okay, well, it's done, and I guess it's okay. But looking back in one or two or three years, the root cause that we find very often is the work wasn't being done competently. Tough questions weren't being asked, and, th and those are learned skills. No one comes to work ready to do that. Those are learned skills, and those are team skills as well. We've got to the last point about the sites themselves. Are any estimates over 12 months old? Would a buyer's due diligence show an unreserved cost over a million dollars? Does a lack of enforcement by a regulator bring the reserve to zero? And, and that's the only reason that the reserve uh, or a liability forecast for a pro estimate is zero, uh, is that there's just lack of enforcement. That's, again, treating environmental liabilities as obligations versus treating them in the old days like contingencies. With a lack of enforcement, you wouldn't book any. So those are questions auditors have the powers to ask today. If they aren't, uh, put a note on your calendar. 2014 was the good old days. But auditors can ask these questions today. 
So a couple of reminders about uh, enforcement and compliance of looking at environmental liabilities. Overstating assets and understating liabilities is a very, very well-known, very specific crime. It's called negligence, malfeasance, securities fraud. Uh, it's, it's illegal, and it has been illegal from the get-go, from all of us came, before all of us came on the scene, and these will be crimes long after all of us leave the scene. Uh, so Sarbanes-Oxley was a major touchstone in accurately stating assets and liabilities and having CFOs in the private sector sign off. Dodd-Frank was a comparable uh, improvement in how auditing is done in the U.S. in the private sector. Uh, there hasn't been an enforcement action of GASB 49 that I've noted on my side, uh, but I do want to point out one of the one example of what enforcement looks out like in the private sector side. And this comes from the SEC prosecuting waste management in 2002. And there was a complaint that you can go look at on the public domain on the website of the SEC. The complaint itself is a pretty interesting and very short read. But the basic point is that it, the SEC accused waste management, who later on acknowledged that they, they committed committed the offense, they acknowledged it. Uh, but the complaint said the company established inflated environmental reserves in connection with acquisitions so that excess reserves could be later <clears throat> and later unwound and used to offset uh, or uh, avoid recording unrelated environmental expenditures. So that when it happened, it was a very, very significant event because the top three officers of waste management uh, had to pay fines and penalties and had to serve time in prison. Another example of uh, enforcement, and this is the only other major one uh, that I found, is back in 2006, uh, is the SEC prosecuted a company in Ohio called Ashland Chemical. Uh, in this case, uh, employees called the ethics hotline of the company. The SEC started an administrative proceeding and found that there were $26 million in improper environmental reserve reductions uh, uh, time period of 1999-2001. And the SEC decided that the company and the remediation manager personally violated a, a, an aspect of federal law, particularly Section 13, Section 12 of the Securities and Exchange Act of 1934, which spells out what, what uh, negligence, malfeasance, uh, and reporting, reporting violations are. So other reminders for the public sector is the IRS does prosecute based on false statements. And if your organization does issue financial statements to investors, <clears throat> to bondholders, or to the, and or to the IRS, you're required to comply with GAAP. There isn't a special portion of GAAP that just applies to public agencies that are part of a state or federal government. Uh, it's, it's just an obligation to comply with GAAP, with listening to your CPAs on staff, your auditors on staff, and complying with their instructions, and investing the resources to ensure you're in compliance. With that, I want to spend a few more minutes on what estimation and disclosure of environmental obligations looks like. And I just want to say this is part of, of what we found through trial and error. A normal, healthy display looks like in Excel. Uh, so I'll give you a, a few minutes to just sort of get, get your bearings on what we're looking at here. <clears throat> but what we found first and foremost that helps is using a common work breakdown structure, or common WBS, as I'm labeled in the top center of the slide, common work breakdown structure across the entire portfolio. Why a common work breakdown structure? Well, it helps if you're using Oracle Financials or PeopleSoft or SAP to, to roll that information up and compare budgets or forecasts to actuals. If you're coding the proposals, coding the forecasts, and coding the invoices, all with the same information. So starting out wherever you are, can't travel back in time, but starting wherever you are today and transitioning to a common work breakdown structure, I promise you, will pay you huge dividends We've got an Excel display here that we've done a screen capture on to just show the, co the common work breakdown structure ties in with the data immediately to the left, which is the, des the description of what the common WBS element is. And then you move off to the right, and you see basically the years are in columns, and the cost forecasts are just entered in individual cells. And where the numbers are over, uh, let's say, $50,000 or $250,000, a number in that range, it's appropriate to do a bracketing process. We found through trial and error uh, that, that if a number is above uh, $250,000, it's got a lot of subcomponents and, and some uncertainty to it. It's important to differentiate between what's known and what is, what is expected and what is hoped for. It's important to split numbers up that way. Um, you may ask yourself, why do I have to to split up numbers that are just a forecast from outside. 
it goes back to fair value measurement. Fair value measurement has a hierarchy in place. And so under FASB, you're required to identify a number as being a level one with known observable inputs, level two, derivative of known observable inputs, and level three, a free-for-all. There's just no known observable inputs. Okay. So by differentiating the estimate between the level three numbers, which most everyone in preparing an environmental forecast, an environmental liability cost forecast will say, all these numbers are level three estimates, to which I say, that's not my experience. Uh, a cubic yard of sediment will break down into a cubic yard and a half of material going onto a truck, and that will cost a certain amount to truck away, predictable amount to truck away, and it'll cost a predictable amount to place into a landfill. Uh, that's a, that's a known distance away from the construction site. There are level two and level one observables. Uh, so again, if you're going to fair value measurement, having a spreadsheet like this, having a clear statement of what are going to be the level one, level two, and level three uh, observables or unobservable quantities, having those assumptions documented in a spreadsheet like this will pay off dividends because inevitably people move on, projects mature, projects are executed. Projects need to be recycled back to an earlier stage and redone. Having the assumptions documented as fair value measurement assumptions, level one, level two, level three, it'll pay off huge dividends. I just ask you to trust me on this one, but if you'd like to see a demo of it, uh, please uh, uh, please give me a note on that. Um, there's a question we've got about uh, uh, fair value measurement. There's a note here that says, uh, I, in the exposure draft for fair value measurement, I don't see that it applies to pollution remediation obligations. I only see that it applies to investment with specific definition. That's actually not correct. Fair value measurement applies to the entire balance sheet. Fair value measurement is specifically spelled out to apply to pension plans that have assets. So fair value measurement needs to be measured more or less every day uh, for, for adequacy in a pension plan. However, fair value measurement applies to every number across a balance sheet, assets, liability, shareholder equity, it applies broadly to the entire document. There isn't a cherry picking that says fair value measurement only works for financial assets like stocks and bonds that are in things like a pension plan. It applies to the entire balance sheet. So uh, if there's interest, I'll, I'll find the exact citation and uh, pull that data forward. But uh, under FASB, fair value measurement applies to everything and GASB is moving in that specific direction. And uh, I can help talk through interpretation of that based on my, my experience with working with uh, FASB 157 and uh, ASC 820, which is what it's uh, uh, redefined as today under FASB. Thanks for that question. Very useful. Uh, under GASB 49, there are two key sections about recognition benchmarks and obligating events. They're spelled out right in GASB. Uh, paragraph 13 covers what recognition benchmarks are. Paragraph 11, which is our next slide, We'll cover what the obligating events are. It's important, essential, that every site have a review, like we've got in the lower part of the screen here, a review of what happens, what's happened at this site regarding each of those recognition benchmarks, each of those obligating events. So we've developed checklists to do in Excel to just do exactly that, uh, to, to go through each site and document where each recognition benchmark uh, stands. Um, the, the uh, receipt of administrative order is the first and foremost of the, uh, the recognition benchmarks. That is, if there's been an order by a regulatory agency that tells uh, a public agency complying with GASB 49, you have to carry out the study and remediation and or remediation work, and you have to carry it out immediately for your risk clients and penalties. Well, that receipt of administrative order is, again, an unequivocal statement from an outsider that you've got a pollution remediation obligation. Uh, the next point is participating as a PRP or a responsible party in the assessment or investigation of the site. So coming to the meetings, uh, sending an expert to help work through the allocation. That's, again, evidence that you're involved in a pollution or mediation obligation. If there's completion of a corrective measures feasibility study, and a feasibility study is, a, um, is just a financial analysis of what cleanup alternatives will work, but if, if this document has been completed, not necessarily by your organization, but by someone, and it's looking like you may be responsible for some, most, all the cost of this, that's the completion aspect. If, if there's been a completed corrective measure feasibility study, uh, 
um, that's again another recognition benchmark for reassessing whether an environmental liability forecast or a pollution remediation obligation forecast uh, is, is worth updating. The next uh, recognition benchmark is if there's an issuance of a, uh, an authorization to proceed by a regulator to go carry out cleanup work. So an, an authorization to proceed is, again, another unequivocal point that you've got a pollution remediation obligation in your hands. The last is finally the, uh, the remediation design and implementation all the way through O&M and post-remediation monitoring. So this is, again, a, a conversation, an iterative conversation going back and forth between a public agency and a regulatory body saying, you know, here's what we think the cleanup should be, here's the technology we think will work, here's the technology we agree will be applied, here's the time span, here are the measuring parameters, here's what done will look like. So again, those are the recognition benchmarks. As a site, as a site goes through these recognition benchmarks, GASB 49 says, redo your estimate. Validate, verify that your estimate is current and correct. Those are minimums. I'd advocate to you in working with, with thousands of environmental cleanup sites over the last 25 years, this is the bare bones minimum. Um, bare bones minimum. Moving on to the obligating events, uh, it's more or less similar to the recognition benchmarks on the previous uh, slide, but these are stated uh, uh, in GASB 49, paragraph 11, section 11. Uh, have any of the following obligating events occurred is the question that you ought to ask staff and, and project teams and external consultants and internal and outside counsel. Ask if any of these things have occurred as remediation commenced, like a remedial investigation or a feasibility study. Cleanup work itself, like an emergency response. Uh, if the operations and maintenance work is going on already. You may find that you're, you're, you're joining a project that's already decades in the making and it needs to finally be recognized as a pollution remediation obligation. You may find that in your career. Um, but my point is, if remediation is commenced, then it does need to be looked at as a pollution remediation obligation. Next, is there pollution or imminent endangerment? And this is, if, if you ever want to find a touchy subject, uh, this is a touchy, touchy subject. This requires not only scientific interpretation and data to be actually collected out in the field, which people are generally paranoid about doing, but actually requires a legal and regulatory uh, interpretation from an environmental consultant and often from an environmental attorney. So it requires collaboration of several people to agree or not agree uh, about the, the status of, of pollution and imminent endangerment. It will save you some trouble. You will rarely get agreement on whether there is or isn't pollution and imminent endangerment. Everyone will agree that the site is not an acute hazard, that there are not large bird kills or fish kills. Or, or the, the site is not on fire. Everyone will agree transparently to those measures, but they will have trouble agreeing on an objective standard for whether there's pollution and imminent endangerment to human health and the environment. It will be tough to get agreement uh, because it requires professional judgment. It requires study and it requires time and money. And again, if, if you're just asking a person for a quick opinion without giving them any facts, they'll probably say something like, until I know more, yeah, you should work on the assumption that it is a problem. So data is the answer to this question, and data is, is, is sometimes the hardest thing to find uh, in, in uh, working with that. Next is a permit violation. Again, similar to the previous point, uh, permit violation usually takes hard data to say, here's what the permit allows, here's what we're actually discharging, we're in violation of our permit. It can be tough for an organization to stand up and say, yes, we're we're, uh, you know, we don't have, you know, we have good people, we have good intent, but here we're doing something that we don't intend to do. We're violating a permit, uh, and, but that's part of an obligating event. Uh, and once we discover that we have an obligating event, now we have to look at whether we've got a pollution remediation obligation on it. The next two points are more uh, for a definition to work through with an environmental attorney uh, who will be able to uh, confirm if, if there's been recognition by a cognizant regulatory authority or another PRP, that your organization is a PRP. Uh, and those, that usually happens formally with, uh, with letters and, and certified mail. So. Next is, is if, the, if your organization has been recognized in a lawsuit, uh, and that uh, has a, uh, some details to usually record about the nature of the lawsuit, uh, about what sort of problems uh, outsider is claiming your organization is 
responsible for, and what is the value of the claim being asserted. So those are the, the five um, obligating events that are stated in GASB 49. As we work with them, we found that asking these questions every year is essential. Running through this checklist every single year is incredibly important. So as I go through these, uh, I see that, that uh, we don't have any questions and we'll just move forward here. But I assert for you, if you don't have a checklist like this going back eight years for GASB 49 compliance, it's probably going to be a challenge to, uh, to, to get the training, get the tools, and get the procedures in place. But that's part of the job, is documenting compliance with GASB 49 by running through these two simple checklists, uh, the five, I'm sorry, the, uh, the five recognition benchmarks in the previous slide and the five obligating events here um, uh, on the following slide. With that, let me roll forward and say here's what ultimately what having a good uh, review of the recognition benchmarks, a good forecast, and a good uh, review of the obligating events will look like. It'll look like you have uh, an incredibly great spreadsheet that identifies what is on the watch list, what is going to be on the pollution remediation obligation reserve list someday. So a number goes in one or two places once it's been determined to be a pollution remediation obligation. Either it goes on the reserve today, it's booked today, or it belongs on a watch list like this. And this yellow-headed table here is what a watch list looks like. It says, these are coming. We haven't hit the right recognition benchmark or the right obligating event yet, but these are coming. And it's a, it's a fairly straightforward organizational exercise. But it takes a lot of thinking to get to this point. This is what a year three, you know, after three years of effort, this is what a, a Rev three or year three watch list should look like. But it'll take time to get there. But the basic point is that it's got four columns to it. A recognition trigger, what has to happen in terms of a recognition benchmark or an obligating event. And it's very specific. It's not just, you know, hey, we're going to hit the PRP recognition uh, obligating event or, or, or recognition benchmark. It's something very, very specific that will have to happen. There has to be in the next column over an amount at risk, a future reserve increase that the organization is going to have to recognize. The next column over, the probability this will even occur. And then a date by which we expect this recognition uh, trigger to occur. So recognition trigger is my term for an obligating event or a recognition benchmark. But it's basically saying when these things happen, it'll be time to take something off of the watch list, put it onto the reserve, at the value more or less stated in the amount column. So that, let me move forward in the interest of time here and uh, kind of sum up on our takeaways here. And I do want to thank you all for your attention as we approach the end of the hour here. Uh, it's, it's important to be ready to rethink reserve policies. GASB 49 has been out for almost eight years. If you haven't rethought reserve policies recently, keep in mind, fair value measurement is coming, asset retirement obligations uh, uh, portions of GASB. That is coming to 2015 for fair value measurement, 2016 for asset retirement obligations. Those will further refine the types of numbers that belong on the books of your organization. And again, you can have a state or a state or federal agency. You can have a county, municipal, local government, a port authority, an airport, a university, a college. Whatever your entity is, I promise you, the questions will come up. The environmental liabilities will be known and the liabilities will have to be booked and then discharged, and then the transactions will have to be closed out. Sooner rather than later is always the right way to go. So prepare for fair value measurement and AROs. Remember that zero reserves and a zero watch list is an explicit statement. An auditor can hang people based on them saying, there's nothing to reserve here. There's nothing on the watch list here. There's nothing here. That explicit statement that a site is clean, I, I haven't seen that be a statement that's worth backing up. Sewer outfalls, off-site sediments, groundwater that's never been sampled. A lack of data doesn't mean it's clean. A lack of data doesn't mean the reserve should be zero. Because again, if you go to a counterparty, if you do a fair value measurement, and you say, what would a peer organization value this if they had to acquire it from us? They would put a hefty premium on not having enough information, not having enough hard data. So again, no data is not a justification for having a zero reserve. Just having the money to study a site is the minimum reserve today. Develop and use a watch list is, is another one of my takeaways that I want to share with you today. Calculate and look at counterparty default risk, which is actually an entire webinar that we're uh, able to present if you're interested in seeing that. 
and confirm, work with your tools, training, and procedure to make sure that those will pass audit, not just the math that was done, but that you have good tools, training, and procedures to ask tough questions. With that, I just want to give you a sense that counterparty risk of default is a part of ASC 410, which is under FASB. It's also referenced indirectly today under GASB 49. So GASB 49 says you should have a comprehensive life cycle cost forecast. It doesn't say comply with ASC 410-30 because GASB 49 came out before ASC 410-30 came out. But I just want to tell you that GASB 49 wraps up this obligation inside. And it says in ASC 410-30, assess the likelihood that other PRPs will or won't pay their full allocable share of a joint and several liability. I'll spare the rest of the, the citations there. But this language was out in 1996. If you go to the, the, the point at the bottom, the very bottom of the slide, their key takeaways is ASC 410-30-30-7 is the exact same language, the same punctuation, the same capitalization, the same syntax as SOP 96-1 paragraph 6.20, which came out in 1996, which came out in draft form two years before that. This language has been around. It's not new. If you have a multi-party liability, you're supposed to look at the ability to pay of the other parties in deciding what to book on your own. And not every long-term deep pocket PRP is going to be around forever. Case in point, General Motors and Chrysler both defaulted on part of their environmental liabilities as part of their bankruptcy process uh, in the last five years. Uh, no one uh, going into 2005 thought General Motors would ever default on their multi-party liabilities. So if they were asked, they probably booked zero. However, June 1st of 2009, when they did file Chapter 11, all that that uh, presumption that there would be no that there no counterparty default risk from General Motors, all of that did have to change. Counterparty risk of default is also re-expressed in a couple different ways under fair value measurement. So here's ASC 820. ASC 820 is fair value measurement under FASB. So this is coming to GASB. It's just a preview of what's to come. ASC 820-10-35-17 says the fair value of a liability. Fair value of a liability reflects the effect of non-performance risk, which is counterparty default. Your other PRP doesn't pay their share, and you're stuck with their share under joint several liability. Here's a kicker. Non-performance risk includes, but may not be limited to, a reporting entity's own credit risk. In other words, if you, uh, if your organization has the same credit stress that the city of Detroit is now going through, which is is bankruptcy, uh, uh, chapter chapter nine, uh, I'm sorry, chapter uh, chapter five, but uh, uh, municipal bankruptcy filing, uh, that the ability to pay of an entity going through bankruptcy is completely up in the air. There is no long-term promise that an entity will keep the promises that it made 10 or 20 or 30 years ago to remediate a site once it goes through financial stress and a bankruptcy filing. Uh, and that's just one of the ways that an entity can, can absolve its environmental liabilities without actually remediating the site. So I just want to point out these aspects of GAAP that are in, uh, in FASB. They apply to GASB filers today because of GASB 55. They're relevant today. But the GASB projects team in Connecticut is also preparing, sorry for that, uh, is, is also preparing a specific statement about complying uh, or, or having fair value measurement just relevant to environmental uh, pollution remediation obligations and to, uh, to GASB itself. So with that, I just want to close off in the interest of time and say I think we're all caught up in questions uh, if you've got any other questions, feel free to drop me a note. We're at the 65-minute the, uh, mark of our presentation, and we've got 75 minutes total uh, allocated for this. So again, if you've got any questions, feel free to drop, me as, uh, drop them in as we go forward here. I just want to wrap up with a couple points about who are the counterparties that are out there that may trigger pollution remediation obligations for your organization. And first and foremost, in my experience, has been any cleanup sites where your organization is the PRP group's banker, where the money comes into your organization from other PRPs, and then you're the entity that's hiring the contractor. You're the entity that's hiring the site investigation or site assessment consultant. You're the company that's hiring the landfill to take the waste that comes off the project. If you're the banker, money's coming in and money's going out, okay, 
but if you have a contract for the money to go out, you don't necessarily have a, a contract for the money to come in. And that's that's the misbalance. So if you're exposing your organization's cash flow, you've got counterparty risk, both in the short term, the very, very short term, and over the very long term. Successor owners of properties are inevitably uh, your key counterparties in working on pollution remediation obligations. If someone buys a property from your organization without a complete environmental assessment or knowing that the site's contaminated, and then they take the site on, and they have a, a spill or an environmental release of some kind, or, or just sloppy housekeeping. However that happens, those successor owners may default to the environmental regulators, to the community. They may default on their obligations. And by virtue of being in the property chain, your organization will be drawn back in under joint and several liability to take back your site and to manage that pollution remediation obligation as if it is your own. So if your, your organization leases out property to a tenant, let's say at an airport you, you rent out property to a, a car rental agency and they refill their cars with gasoline every day, well, you have a risk that their underground storage tanks will leak. They are your counterparties. They're your successor owners or your tenants. If you run a port authority and you lease out land to, uh, uh, to a manufacturer or a shipper and they have a release or spill on, on your property, you're the guarantor. Your organization is guaranteeing that if, if the company experiencing the release defaults, from a regular's perspective, they've got you. They've got you as the owner and as the and or the predecessor owner. You're both counterparties. You're both in this together. However it plays out, it's not the regulator's problem. It's your problem because you're in the chain. Uh, predecessor owners of properties that you have bought are also your counterparts. Just to continue down the list, if you have JV partners or PRPs working on a multi-party site cleanup or their insurers, they're examples. If you've got other state or federal agencies that are funding orphan shares into cleanups that you're managing and you're depending on that orphan share, they're also your counterparts. The landfills that are taking your waste today, those are your counterparties too. Uh, landfills that took your waste from projects in the past. They are also your counterparties already. If they default, you will probably be drawn back in to help fund that cleanup work. And you'll have a claim, you'll have a contingency, you'll have a pollution remediation obligation because you sent waste to facilities years ago and those facilities may close and need additional cleanup costs from organizations that sent waste to them. I'll spare you the rest of the list and just move on to uh, uh, just the conclusion here about this point about why counterparties matter. FASB, GASB, the International County Standards Board have all made the calculations mandatory. So if an auditor hasn't enforced it yet, 2014 is the good old days. But keep in mind that an auditor's got the powers to enforce that these calculations get done, that you perform the research into who your counterparties are, that you don't have any looming counterparty defaults out there. And if you do, you value your pollution remediation obligations fairly. Another point about this, uh, about why the counterparties matter, is you can take preemptive action. It's okay. You can buy back a formerly owned site before a site goes into enforcement action, before it shows up on a Superfund list. You can form a PRP group before a landfill goes into the CERCLA, Federal CERCLA program. You can cash out a PRP well before they go into Chapter 7 or Chapter 11 uh, on the private sector side. Important points of experience for me is the indemnifications, the guarantees that I see being issued as part of property acquisitions and divestitures rarely get calculated and monetized from an environmental perspective. Uh, they're considered to be remote. They're considered to be inestimable. So the, the, there's thinking about them as contingencies, which I fully understand. However, if there's an inevitable, an inevitable part of anything, it's that what goes around comes around and, and having Deep pockets. If you work for a deep pocket organization, and as a public agency, I assert to you, you really do work for a deep pocket organization like a Fortune 500 company. You've got a stewardship obligation, an asset protection obligation, and you don't want to see polluters uh, uh, polluters not pay, and you don't want to have your entity's budget be exposed to other polluters ditching their share and having that be on your your company's your agency's your I'm going to spare you the detailed calculations of how counterparty calculations of risk works. It's a separate webinar. 
uh, that we've got. It takes about an hour to go through. And we're pretty happy with the Monte Carlo software uh, that we developed to do this. It's uh, something we developed late last year, and we're pretty enthusiastic about it. Uh, if you'd like to see that, uh, please drop me a note. I'll be glad to share that uh, information with you. But I just want to close up with the, uh, the steps about mitigation of counterparties. The first and foremost part is don't assume that all the stories about counterparties are known and clearly documented. That's a really risky assumption to make, is assuming that everyone knows uh, just what environmental counterparties are out there. There's probably real raw research to do and understand. Next to a pivotal point that I found in my experience is knowing when insurance and purchase and sale terms and conditions expire. There can be uh, key, key breakpoints when a liability reverts from one buyer or seller to another. And knowing those terms is often very important to, to knowing when to study a site and know whether you're working on the clock. I'd recommend revisiting a full property list of your entire organization top to bottom every three years and understand if your organization has leased out or leased in any new properties in those three years, bought or sold any properties in those three years, and keep a good long running list. It's also probably useful to, 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 to run a list of uh, waste facilities that you used to use. That record information is probably stored somewhere deep in your organization of landfills uh, and, and waste processors that are, that are used today and also those that are no longer allowed to be used today. That list of, of landfills and, and waste processors that we're no longer allowed to use is probably your most interesting list of all to use. Um, next point, uh, next point of activity is track the counterparties. This is something that ERCI does every month. We track counterparties for Fortune 500 corporations, for uh, circle of PRP groups. We've been doing this for about 12 years, and it is fascinating the time that you have to work with to see a company in financial stress, um, uh, head toward bankruptcy, have liquidity problems, and then default on their environmental obligations. We've seen it many, many, many times. And we can uh, give you a sense of what to look out for and how to work with that uh, knowledge of who your counterparties are and how to prevent losses due to their the possibility of their failing. The last point I want to stress is act on what you learn. Document changes to successors and signs, which means changes to the formal legal names of entities that are your counterparties. Negotiate cash outs or cash ins to wrap up relationships and, and walk away from them where it's uh, feasible. And reward and recognize people that are doing liability prevention activities. That is knowledge and thank people that are taking out of the way steps to prevent liabilities from coming into your organization. It's a wise and useful step that we take. Uh, with that, let me wrap up our presentation for today and say just remember that GAP's evolving. GASB is still working on the convergence with uh, ASC 410-30 and 20, which covers fair value measurement. Also, AROs are coming up as well. So your reserve policy tools and training might not reflect fair value yet. Keep that in mind. Next, use fair value measurement wherever you can. You're allowed to. I highly recommend it. It's a very, very healthy process. If your organization does have policies that say we look for liabilities that are both probable and reasonably estimable, please step back and, and uh, be careful about using it. I see the presentation isn't keeping up on the web link at this point. So with that, I just wanted to close out with a couple of uh, points. If you're looking for more information about ERCI, please go to our website at erci.com. Please drop me an email at john at erci.com if you'd like a needs analysis of what we do versus what your organization may need. If you need a copy of uh, the PDF of this presentation, feel free to drop me a note. We're doing this as an outreach, and we'd like to share this. If you're interested, drop me an email. We'll send you an unlocked PowerPoint version of this as well if you'd like to see that as well. If you need an attendance certificate for continuing education, feel free to drop me a note. ERCI is very small. You can just reach me directly by uh, dropping me an email or giving me a call. We also have a YouTube channel where we record our uh, on-demand webinars. Feel free to uh, uh, look us up or ask me for a copy of the link to that. Uh, you can see all of our webinars available on an on-demand basis, no registration, no fees. You're just able to watch the very same webinar content that we're delivering uh, at your leisure. If you need uh, the citations on where to find FASB and GASB documents, uh, I would uh, prefer to send you directly to the FASB and GASB.org websites so you can see the definitive versions that are available 24 hours a day from the copyright holders. I have my own PDF versions that I keep on my C drive. I'm sure you will uh, 
to uh, on your own. But the core documents themselves are meant to come from the original providers, the original developers of these standards. And I just want to reinforce that if you do get a request uh, to look at the current standards, uh, really there's no substitute for going straight to the FASB or GASB websites, registering for two seconds, it takes no time at all. And then getting the definitive versions from those organizations. It's always the safe bet, always the safest thing. With that, I just want to give you a couple of reminders. There are webinars coming up on looking at environmental liabilities for corporations. I'll be delivering that at this time tomorrow. Reviewing fair value implementation, that'll be this time next week, next uh, Thursday morning, and next Friday morning, uh, environmental auditors and managers. What do you really need to know about environmental liabilities? That'll be our fourth webinar in this series. If you'd like, again, copies of those webinars or copies of the links while we, once we post up our recording, feel free to drop me. With that, feel free to drop off. I'm going to go back to the previous slide and just make sure that I've got that content delivered uh, here fairly um, now that our connection seems to be restored here. Uh, I left off at the estimating and disclosure point. Again, I just want to underscore it's important to use fair value measurement. Stop using probable and, probable and reasonably estimable if that language is still part of your organization's uh, policies. Rethink those policies, procedures, tools, and training. Rebuild them and develop and display a watch list. I gotta say, if there's a, a great takeaway from, from owning a, uh, a reserve forecast for pollution remediation obligations, it's prepare a compliant GASB 49 reserve, and then anything that doesn't fit on that reserve today, store it in the watch list. That's your parking lot of future reserving. Very useful tool. Finally, understand non-performance risk, which is also counterparty default. Those are the same terms. Look inside your portfolio. Look outside your current portfolio of projects or the properties, the addresses, the locations, the facilities where the waste streams of your organization have touched other properties. Calculate, display, and update. And be wary of uh, assertion. It's just a hope. The assertion that the pro there aren't any problems there, there aren't any liabilities there. You'll probably find pollution remediation obligations in places uh, quite consistently. Finally, if you're looking at a transaction, secure the guarantees or, and or cash outs before insolvency uh, of your material risks. So in other words, if you bought a property portfolio from an entity and it looks like that entity is dissolving, settle up your environmental liabilities. Don't wait for them to declare Chapter 7 or Chapter 11 and be no longer viable as a source of funds for your long-term open-ended pollution remediation obligations. Uh, with that, I've uh, covered the, uh, the slide that I had a technical challenge with. And again, I just want to close with this slide. If you'd like to learn more, please drop me a note. Please share these uh, webinar invites as you receive them. We're happy to have any and all come to our webinars in the future. And we hope to see you at one of our ERCI webinars really soon. With that, I'm going to uh, halt the recording. And uh, if you've got any questions, I'll be on the line here for another few